I'm experiencing a little bit of deja vu here today. Didn't we look at 2 Peter 1, 19 through 2, 3 last week? Maybe that was just the bulletin. <laughs> I love when little things like that happen. <laughs> Keeps me on my toes, that's for sure. Yeah. Makes it fun and interesting. So this week we are looking at 1 Peter verses 19. We're going to go through the first three chapters of, or first three verses of chapter 2. Then we're going to take a little bit of a break from 2 Peter. We are definitely coming back to it though because I really want to pick back up on uh, 2 Peter 2, 4 and work from there because there's some really great stuff there uh, that I think we're going to enjoy. Uh, but that is for a later date. Um, as Gene said earlier today, we will be going into Psalms 1 next week. Take a little bit of time in Psalms 1. we got some other things planned, so we'll get back to 2 Peter, though, I promise. But beginning here with 2 Peter 1, 19. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of, of truth into excuse me will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look into your word, as we dig a little deeper, that you work your word through my tongue, that you loosen it to speak freely of what you would have us to know, that it would touch our hearts, influence our lives, so that we grow closer to you through your son Jesus and that we continue to do the great works that you place before us to spread the good news, the gospel, the story, the information, the knowledge, the understanding <coughs> of your coming kingdom that will be established here on earth with the return of your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Sometimes i got to ask for God to loosen my tongue up a little bit because I get tied over it myself a little bit too often. In last week's message, I want to just kind of remind a little bit here. We were looking at Peter's reminder to know and follow God's will. These are truths that Christians know already, but we still require the occasional nudge to remember to keep God first and to be thankful for the salvation he provided through his son Jesus. And I mentioned also last week that throughout the remainder of this chapter, starting with verse 16, that the revelation of God's word and of Jesus' life, a living representation of God's word, would come into sharp focus. And indeed, Peter testified as witness to the many miracles he saw while following Jesus. One that was significant was upon the mountain where he, John, and James witnessed Jesus' transfiguration. They caught a glimpse of the power and glory that Jesus would be granted by our Heavenly Father, when he sends Jesus to establish his kingdom here on earth, they got a glimpse of what the prophecies were talking about, of this coming kingdom, of the power and the majesty, the glory that we would all witness at the trumpet call. And Peter attempted to convey the majesty that he experienced at the sight, along with the reverent awe of hearing God's voice, hearing God's word, speak approval of his son Jesus. He tried. But only these three men were witness to this, these extraordinary events. And every attempt to describe it was inadequate, to say the least. 
And Peter must have known this, for he then turns his attention to the other means of God's revelation, his word, the Bible. Now, this is something that his audience then and now are familiar with. This is something that we can relate to because we have God's word available to us today. And Peter is excited to share this common ground and what he has witnessed occurring from the prophets of old in his own time. And we often talk about what we see happening. The prophecies talk about the end times. And we can certainly look at the things that are going around us, uh, around us in this world. And we can certainly see some of these prophecies being fulfilled. We're in the midst of it. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to say that. Of course, we often think of some of these prophecies and we think this is going to happen. It's going to be quick. It's going to be sudden. And all of a sudden, oh my goodness, here it is. But we're remembering this is God's time, not our own. So sometimes these prophecies that we are thinking we're in the midst of, I guess in the 60s, they say, oh, it's the end times. How many people are running around with signs and said, the end is nigh? <laughs> Happened in the 70s. There's another group that said, oh, the end is near. How many people since the 80s have said that, oh, well, this is when the world is going to end? How many people have said it over the years? And every one of them have been proven wrong because it's an ongoing thing. We're in the midst of the end time. We're in the midst of these prophecies, but we're seeing them occurring. They're, they're coming to life and they're coming true right before us. And Peter was seeing these same things. And he was excited about it. And he was able to relay this to his audience of that time because they were seeing it too. Because they had God's word and they could look at his word and they could look at the prophecies and they could see what was happening. They could understand this. <coughs> He reminds his audience during all this that they that not only are they experiencing this, they're experiencing the realization and fulfillment of God's word as given by the prophets. And then he says, you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. The psalmist wrote about God's word as a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Proverbs 4, 18, 19 reads, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining brighter to the full light of day, but the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. In these days of darkness, we would be foolish. We are in days of darkness. Experiencing loss and hurt and pain and struggle and anger and hatred, violence. We are in days of darkness. We see this. So we would be foolish to ignore this brilliant light that is presented to us. This light that is God's word. We have this glorious light to guide our path until the day when he who is the light of the world, our Savior Jesus, returns. And that will be a day when the lamps, they're no longer needed. Because we'll be in the presence of God. And his radiance will shine brightly upon us. Until then, we wait. There is anticipation. At night, when you're in the lamplight, there's an anticipation. You're thinking about that coming dawn. That rising morning star that you know will outshine the light you're currently in that will outshine your current situation. Likewise, the Old Testament prophecies look ahead to the coming of Christ, to be outshone by him, by that fulfillment of these prophecies themselves. And once Jesus established his Father's kingdom here, God will be with us. We will be able to know God face to face, not just through his word. His word has been such a blessing to us because it has been a revelation of who God is, the love that he has for us, his plan and his will. But think about it. We will be able to know him fully. So you can kind of see why Peter was excited, right? 
This is the revelation that, 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 they're, that they're seeing and that they're talking about. The prophets spoke of the coming of God's kingdom. And they were seeing evidence of the prophecies fulfilled. Peter wanted to assure his audience, though, that the prophecies of this good news, that this was truly the words of God. God spoke through the prophets. He revealed to each of these people his great message of hope and of salvation. And each of them was consistent with God's original design that he laid out since Genesis. It's because their message did not come from them. It did not come from a human mind, a human will. Their words came from God. But that's not to say that they were puppets. They were, they were not. God didn't take control of them and have them write what he wanted. And he didn't dictate to them either. They didn't write word for word what God told them to write. This is why we've got four different gospel accounts that people look at and say, well, they're so different in some ways. Because God inspired these people to write about this message. He gave them the message that he wanted to convey and allowed them to put their own personality, their own style into it, to let who they were come out in what they were saying. To make it connectable, to make it relatable. Not only to the people then, but still to the people today. Verse 21 says that they were carried, or depending on your version, your translation, borne along, that they were impelled. Now the word that's used here is the same Luke used in Acts 27, 15, and 17, referring to a boat carried along by the wind. They were carried along by the Spirit. And yet, even as the boat gets carried along the wind, the pilot of that boat is still capable of steering in a given direction. The wind will still carry it along, but the pilot is still part of that. And just like that, the authors were consciously involved in delivering the most glorious revelations that man could ever hope for. Through these people, through the prophets, through the authors of God's word, we get to know our loving <coughs> Heavenly Father. And his will, his plan for salvation. And then we get to chapter 2. Why does there always have to be a but? It starts with but. Peter presents these amazing truths, and then he gets to chapter 2 and he says, but, because he's cautioning us against lies. He reminds the people that there were false prophets in the past. There were many who were coming up, raising up out of Israel itself, from among the people that were speaking heresies against God, that were prophesying against God, and they told horrible lies that were wrapped up in pretty little packages, saying the things that people wanted to hear, twisting truth to fit their own agendas and their own ideologies and to become popular because it was the things that people wanted to hear. That's what was happening. And Peter reminds them of that. And then he assures them that there will be false teachers. This, he asserts, is a certainty. There will be false teachers. And not only will there be false teachers, but they will come from within the church. They will call themselves Christians. And they will teach all kinds of things that go against what God's word says. One of the biggest issues Peter fought against and that we still face today is the idea that we can be saved and yet go on with our lives unchanged. This is one of the biggest things that Peter was facing in his day and it's still something that is a monumental struggle among Christians and Christian churches because there are people that say that you can be saved. You come to God through Jesus, congratulations, you're saved. You don't have to change anything. 
You can go on doing whatever you want. You can live a life of depravity. You can live a life of drugs and alcohol and, and being mean to people, being selfish. You can be greedy. You can do all of these things because you are saved. It's a message that not only are people within the church speaking, it's a message that some churches are speaking. But it's not the message that God gave us in his word. God told us that when we come to him through Jesus, that we are to die to our sin. We are to give up that old life. We are to have new life. New life doesn't mean being the same, remaining unchanged. No, new life is change. And yet, this is something that we say. Scripture is clear on this. Over and over again, give up your sins. Walk away from that. You need to leave everything. When Jesus went to his disciples and he said, hey, Levi, come with me. Levi said, okay, and he left everything. When he came to the, the brothers in the boat and that were with their father fishing, he says, come follow me. They said, okay, and they left everything. Because this new life is change. Change from what we were, from our sinful ways, from our wanton sinfulness. Because we're still going to be sinful, right? Let's be honest. We're still sinful. We're never going to get away from that. Not until Jesus returns and we are made new, completely new. We are still sinful. But it's the difference between wanting sinfulness, which is our old life, and changing. Avoiding being remorseful, repentant of our sins. That's the difference. We need to be conscious of this. We need to be understanding when people are presenting these messages to us. We need to be, di to, to be diligent to not only discern what we hear and what we're taught. So I say this on a fairly regular basis. If, you, if you're listening to what I'm saying, I hope and I pray that you are going back to God's word. You're making sure that I am actually ta taking from God's <coughs> word and speaking his truths. Because I don't want to slip. I, I could. <coughs> So I need you, and Brother Jay is awesome for that. I need you to keep me in account. <clears throat> and I'll keep you in account. That's what we're here for, to keep each other in account, to hold each other accountable that we're speaking God's word. So when you hear me speaking and I'm teaching you something, you need to discern that what I'm teaching is correct, that it's God's word. But we also, ourselves, we need to make sure that what we are saying and teaching in our own lives is according to God's word and his will. God's word is trustworthy. It is true. But like anything else, it is only as good or useful as we dictate through our study and application of it. God's word is amazing truth. But like anything else, if we don't know it and then know it and apply it, if we don't apply it, what good is it? This is what Paul is telling us. He's reminding us of these things. See, he witnessed something that was so amazing and so wonderful that words can never do it justice. But he also was witnessing God's word reaching fulfillment, coming to life around him and through him. He was seeing the prophecies fulfilled. And we can relate to that because of our own studies. If we're understanding God's word, we know God's word, we can relate to and we can see what's going on. And we can get excited for that as well. And it's also through our experiences with our God that we can relate to this. 
We know, we know the truth. Each and every one of us knows the truth. We know right from wrong. We know what is good and what is bad. And a big part of the reason for that, I would say the entire reason for that, is because of God's word. The revelation that is there for us, his will given to us. I look at this and I, I'm, I'm amazed at what I see in his word time and time again. I'm amazed at the truth and the love and the grace and the forgiveness that's there. I look at this and I, I say thank you. I say thank you to our almighty God for this hope of salvation that we have through his son Jesus. I say thank you to our almighty God for his word that guides us and reveals his nature and his love for us. I say thank you to our almighty God for this reminder given to us through his faithful and loving servant. He's an amazing God. There's no two ways about it. But we can be led astray so easily if we don't follow the path. And the only way we know the path is if we're using the map. If we're using the guidebook. That's what Peter's reminding us. That's what God tells us every day. He nudges us. Most times we ignore it. We, I know I'm not alone on that. But we need to make time to be in his word so that we don't get led astray, so that we don't get led down a path by the people that are speaking wonderful and pretty things. Because I'll tell you right now that the people that are saying that you can come to God through Jesus and be saved and you don't have to change they're gaining followers. They're gaining popularity. Because that's what people want to hear. People want to hear that they can continue living life how they've been. And they don't have to change. Because change is, let's face it, change is hard. Nobody wants to change. What's the average, what's the average amount of time before a New Year's resolution is broken? It's pretty short. I think like mid-February is by then. Four weeks? Four days. Four days. <laughs> Four days. Okay? And why? Because resolutions are changed. When we make a resolution, it's something that we want to change, something that we want to do different, right? And it takes four days for us to go, oh, never mind. Change is hard. And so that's why these people, these folks out there within churches and that are churches themselves are saying, the things that people want to hear. These wonderful, pretty things that tickle their ears. But that's not God's word. It's not what we need. It's going to lead to destruction. That destruction, as the verses here tell us, it's waiting. It's waiting for that time. Because I tell you right now, when Jesus is sent back, when God sends him back and the judgment is there, and we're all standing before that throne, Those tickled ears are going to be really, really warm. And that's not something that you want. We want to be, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. The only way we're going to hear that is if we know God through his son and through his word. That revelation is there for us. So whether or not we take advantage of it. Let us close with one final song and then a word of prayer. Turn if you would in your brown hill.